Welcome back to the OHSU Effect Inside Health and Science at OHSU. Have you been listening all morning and already forgotten which doctors we've had on? Happens to the best of us, but researchers up at OHSU are working on ways to improve our memory. With me now on the OHSU Effect is Dr. Alex Stevens, a research scientist. Good morning. Good morning. So how does our memory work? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. Um, we've, we've learned a lot about how memory works, um, but, but there's still a lot to learn. Um, but basically, uh, memory takes time. And what I mean by that is uh, when we lay down memories, we start by experiencing something. And if we're lucky, we hang on to it for a little while. And over time, it gets consolidated. And that way we can access it later and remember past events. If we're not really attending to what we're doing, a lot of times we don't remember, though. Well, are, are brains kind of like computer hard drives? Is there a limit to what, how much we can remember? Uh, our brains are a lot more complicated than a hard drive. Um, <laughs> we've we've got to get this stuff in. Um, there have to be things to remember. Um, but there probably are limits, and the limits are probably uh, a result of how much we can learn in any given time period. Well, people are always looking for tips to improve their memory. Share some of yours with us. So... Probably one of the most important things uh, to think about when you're trying to remember something is to pay attention. If you're not attending to something fully, you're probably not going to remember it very well. So, for example, if you're in a conversation and someone comes up and you're introduced to them and you want to remember their name, sometimes you're thinking more about what you want to say or what they're saying and you completely gloss over the name and you realize two seconds later, I don't remember. Well, if you pay attention to their name when they say it, for one, it helps to repeat it back, for example, and then use it a couple of times in conversation with them. And that way, uh, you have a better chance of hanging on to it and remembering it later. And they will be impressed with your manners by using their (laughs) name. (laughs) Well, that's some short-term tips, but what about long-term? Long-term, you know, like a lot of things, what it comes down to is practice. It's uh, reviewing information. It's remembering things when you, uh, when you need to and, and, and really focusing on what you're trying to remember. You know, a classic example is you know, putting down your keys, for example. Come in, you throw your keys down, and you go off and do something. And then a couple of hours later, you're wondering where you put your keys. Well, one way to take care of that is always put your keys in the same place. Um, but, but a lot of it has to do with sort of intentionality, really, really paying attention to what you're doing when you're doing it, and that can make a big difference. So when we forget, a lot of people assume it's just related to aging. Is that true? Aging has something to do with it. Obviously, as we get older, our brains um, have a lot more to remember and a lot more to store, uh, and sometimes that information can I- interfere with new information we're learning. But... Um, In many cases, things like stress uh, can have a huge impact on our memory. So sometimes when we think uh, our memory is failing, it really has to do more with stressful life events that are occurring and distractions we have. Interesting. So when is this an issue where we should talk to our doctor if, if we're feeling that really our memory is fading fast? If you start noticing that there are really severe memory losses and lapses, if you find yourself unable to find your way to work, for example, then you might want to consider consulting a, a doctor. But if these are you know, lapses of attention and things like that, think about what's going on in your life. Sometimes it's stress that, that can really induce what seems like a severe memory impairment. So I understand that part of your research also deals with ADHD. Tell us about that. Mm-hmm. We, we study attention deficit disorder in uh, adults. And uh, ADHD is a widely diagnosed and and sort of poorly understood uh, diagnosis. We don't, it's got a lot of different symptoms. People look very different who have it. What we're trying to understand is what the, what we call the cognitive mechanisms are that are really at the core of the deficit. And that is, is it, is it really a deficit of attention? Is it that people can't pay attention? Is it that they have a difficult time uh, attending to information when there's lots presented? Um, one thing we know is that when uh, children with ADHD get older, sometimes the symptoms clear up, and that suggests there may be some developmental component to it. 
in adults, those things that persist are inattentiveness and distractibility and things like that. Those are hard to nail down. So we're trying to trying to get a handle on what really causes that. And you said that word attending again. If you're not paying attention, if you're not attending to that information, if you have ADHD, then you're not going to remember, right? It can you do see memory impairments because they there's something about really focusing on information and being able to retain it and work it over that really seems to make a difference. And if you're impaired in that, you're going to have memory impairments. You also study something called brain plasticity. <clears throat> What's that? Brain plasticity is really uh, plasticity is really what is the marvel of the brain. The brain is always changing, and it has two things. One, it has to maintain what it has. It has to maintain its structure and its functions, but it also has to be able to adapt. And plasticity really just means that when we mem- remember something new or when we learn something new, the brain is somehow changing to take take that into account and store it. Um, for example, some of our work has been on the blind. And this is blindness gives you a chance to look at some of the really fascinating degrees of plasticity you can see in the brain. So there's an area in the back of your brain called the visual cortex. And that's where all your visual processing goes on. When we see the world, it's actually taking place in that area. Well, in the blind, that area completely reorganizes and becomes used for other things. And so that's sort of a dramatic example of plasticity, that we see that area involved in auditory perception, auditory memory, speech memory, things like that. Now, can that research help people, um, say with ADHD, kind of reorganize their brains into being able to remember and pay attention? Well, what we're hoping is that um, by understanding a little bit about plasticity, we can also learn how we might better train the brain. So that's a hot topic, and a lot of people go out and buy these memory training programs. It's a huge industry, but but we really don't know how it works. And, and if we're going to develop effective techniques, um, we really have to understand that plasticity and and how we might be able to use it to our advantage. Well, where can people learn more if they want to learn more about your research or maybe some tips about about sharpening their memory? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember my uh, web address. <laughs> but if you go to the OHSU website uh, and um, search for information on memory and, and aging, um, there's a lot up there. Great. Dr. Alex Stevens, a research scientist up at OHSU. More of the OHSU effect next on KXL.